Okay. So, bad news. They let a madman in the conference room. Uh, the madman is me, and I'm going to take you into two rabbit holes. Uh, so, one is the Rust trade system and the fact that you can do computation with it, and the other one is ABI. So, uh, but first, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about me. I've been using Rust professionally since 1.28. I'm basically a dinosaur, uh, and I'm using it right now at Zetascale, uh, working on Eclipse Zeno. So, it is open source, it's written entirely in Rust. Uh, and it does publisher subscriber semantics and distributed queries. It's generally awesome. Uh, it's, it makes a mesh network uh, with non-IP links and IP links. Uh, it is uh, two orders of magnitude faster than MQTT and Kafka, and we have lots of plugins, which is where the ABI rabbit hole comes from. So, time for the madness to begin, and before the, ba for the very start, we're gonna start with counting. So. Worst way you can represent numbers is by just spelling them out. So, zero, one, two, three, four, five. That's gonna get very old, very early. So, let's do something better. Uh, we've got, we're in Italy, so let's try piano numbers. <laughs> so, struck zero. How do you do one? You increment. <laughs> One is the increment of zero. Two is the increment of the increment of zero. Six is the increment of 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 zero. Yeah, thanks, Piano. Uh, but it works. Uh, if we just type this out, we've got one, two, and six. Great. Uh, but numbers on their own are kind of useless. So I want to do functions, and here's a very tortured way of defining a function. So it's a mathematical object that associates a value to its inputs. And if you torture it a bit, you get a trait. It's a language object, and it lets you associate types to generic inputs. So that is the thing. You can use traits as function of types. Self is always going to be your first argument. If you want to have a function that doesn't have argument, you just implement it for every single type that exists. Uh, otherwise, if you want to have more arguments, you just put them in the traits generics, and you use the associated types as your outputs. And let's just make an addition as demonstration. So I'm gonna name it plus, because I know where the talk goes later. And I'm gonna do zero plus zero. That's zero, great. Zero plus literally anything else is going to be that anything else. Note that I can't use T because I've already used zero and there would be a conflict. And increment of something plus increment of something else is increment of increment of the addition of these two. But you need to prove it to the compiler first, so you have to add a where close. So that's our addition, great. It works. Uh, here, I just told the compiler to assign unit to a slot of type 2 plus 2, and the compiler is not happy because you cannot assign unit to 4. <laughs> so, we've got, uh, we've got functions. Let's do collections because numbers are kind of limited. Empty collection is super easy. It's just a struct that's called empty. Then you have lists. You, put, you take two generics, a head and a tail. That's a linked list in static version. You can do trees. You just put a list in the children. And you can even do graphs, but I suggest you don't put the value straight into the first generic, otherwise you won't be able to do cycles without having infinite memory to write the type. So instead, do two lists, a list of nodes and a list of edges, and I haven't been crazy enough yet to try it, so if one of you does, please send it to me. Uh, so, now that we have collections, we can make better numbers. We can make them like we write them. They're a list of digits. So, struct zero, still. <laughs> but now, one is a list that has one bit, and it's set to one. Two is one zero, and six is one one zero. Now it's getting easy. And you can even do that with other bases. So here's the, uh, at the bottom here is, this in, is in decimal version. If one of you implements it, please tell me, it sounds fun. <laughs> Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. Uh, Tycnum is actually the inspiration for this, and I'm actually going to use it right now. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so, Tycnum uh, uses the standard operations as the function traits, and if we try it out, it works super well. So, if I make a variable and add 2 and 4 in there, I get 6 in binary as the type. And if I switch, uh, one of my variables, uh, so 2 plus 6, I get 8, and Rust and Rise are super fast, 
so I didn't even get the time to get a break. Uh, the one thing I don't like about type num, sorry, is that anytime you want to do something generic, you start to get into workloads hell. So here I have, I want to multiply C by the sum of A and B, which means I have to prove that A can be added to B, and then I need to prove that the output of A plus B is multiplicable by C. And this gets very old very fast when you try to do actual stuff. <laughs> so let's do better functions. <laughs> so like I said, bad things about what we have is that we have workloads hell. Anytime you want to do an operation, you need to do a bound. And anytime you do a bound, you need to do more bounds. So this is going to be very old very quickly. And also, it's kind of verbose to use because you have to use the, the type as straight syntax for anything as soon as you've got arguments. But since last year, we've got generic associated types, <laughs> which means that we can move the generics from the trait to the output types. And this looks a bit like a class to me. And it kind of is. Uh, you can even type it. So here I have a, a class, my class, that has two methods. Foo takes only self and returns something of some class. And bar takes a second argument of some class and returns something of my class. We finally have found an object-oriented language that is worse than Java. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm going to talk to you with it. So uh, I'm going to use the fact that type num already defines booleans as b0 and b1 and defines the termination u term for 0 and u int that take the more significant bits to the left and the least significant bits to the right. And I'm going to define a boolean class. So uh, it has negation and or xor, all the great ones. I'm going to implement it for b0. Super easy, you just read a truth table and just put the zero side on it. Same thing for B1, and now Russ is happy again because B1 wasn't a Boolean just a minute ago. So, we've got Booleans. Now I'm gonna tell you a bit more about this weird language that I affectionately call Type Foo. It's like Kung Fu, but with types. So, Type Foo 101, here are two ways to spell it. And Type Foo is a dynamically typed, pure functional, <laughs> programming language, <laughs> which means, and the way you do it is that anytime you do impl x for y, you're actually defining the y pattern of every function of the trait x. So like most functional language, you work mostly by using pattern matching. And like most functional language, your only way of doing loops is recursion. And you're gonna have to pray a lot that your recursion is not infinite because the compiler is eager which means that if you have infinite recursion, your compiler will run forever unless it detects it and then it will just tell you I, am, I have hit my recursion limit, sorry. Uh, also, associated types are, they'll always belong to an open set, which means that if you have only B0 and B1 as your booleans, which makes a lot of sense, Rust doesn't know that. So it is not sufficient to implement something for B0 and B1 to prove to Rust that you've implemented it to all booleans. You can try trade ceiling, it doesn't work. It makes me very sad, please fix it. <laughs> and finally, you can use bounds to specialize a pattern, but since you've, the, you've used the pattern, it could conflict, and since there's no way to express mutually exclusive bounds, you can't actually make Rust let you use the same pattern twice. You can use new types to get around it, and you can use, there are some ways to do specialization, but they basically bring you back into where close hell. So let's keep going. Let's do proper math, let's do unsigned. Uh, so I'm gonna start defining something that has a least significant bit and can be shifted right by one because that is literally uint. And once we have that, I'm gonna give you a tip. Anytime you want to do math with a type system, circuitry is your friend. Uh, circuitry is where they work with truth tables and programming in type foo is basically just writing truth tables in the type system. So they've done a lot of the work for you. So if you want to implement something, look at circuits. So let's keep going. Uh, I'm gonna add ternaries and, a way, and full adder sections to my booleans. And now that it is typing somewhat slower than usual, <laughs> I can do my uh, first implementation of unsigned and I can add the real kicker. I'm gonna do addition and multiplication on stage right now. All I do is press C. The keyboard is the one that does the thing. <laughs> so 
So for that, I'm going to need increment, add with carry, is zero, and remove zeros. Those are mainly going to be for optimization of multiplication. And once I've got that, is zero and remove extra bits are super easy for, t for zero. And increment, you just give one. Add, you just remove your right-hand side. So yeah, I'm not going to go into the details, otherwise this is going to be way too long. But the gist of it is this code literally works. So yeah, it's going to keep on typing. And we have addition and multiplication. And all these things actually work. And now that we have some types of types, we can actually do the same operation we did earlier. But this time, the bounds are all about the fact that our types are unsigned. They're not anymore about the, uh, they're not spilling the guts of what we're doing anymore. So I consider this slightly better. And also, look, no as anywhere in there. Nice. <laughs> so, cool. What can we do with that? Uh, there's quite a bit you can do. You can do better numbers again, but this time they're for runtime. So now you're actually going to use them. Uh, so basically, you can put your units into your runtime types, and I suggest you do, because one, conversions are annoying. Two, they have crashed Marshall orbiters. So I should, uh, and the Marshall orbit, space orbiter was costing half a billion, so they're expensive sometimes. <laughs> And also, homogeneity is a good safeguard. If you do scientific computing, the easiest way to check that you have goofed something is that the units don't match. And there are actually a few ways to do it. Uh, simple SI unit uh, is super complete, super impressive, considering from what I've gathered, it's all manual implementation. So the guy who wrote that wrote a lot of code. Uh, FTS unit is based on type num. But it only supports the weight, distance, and time units of uh, sections of the SI system. So if you have to express an electric field, you're out of luck. But you can use UOM for units of measurement. And this one is super complete. It also uses type foo, but I don't think it uses type num. And they also like to remind you of the mask orbiter. Uh, you can also use it for other things in scientific computing. Uh, you can use it to keep track of dimensions and properties of your matrices and tensors. So if you have matrices that you know are diagonal or triangular, you can pick more appropriate algorithms to compute. And this is how it would basically look. You could have a tensor. Type T is F64, for example. Dimensions is going to be a list, because that's why you can express tensors. And properties, you could have anything that tells you it's diagonal, it's triangular, it's whatever, which then you can change your impulse to have whatever suits it best, and you can have proper inverse, all of these things. And you can also use all of this information to decide whether your thing is going to be, is going to be stored on the stack. If it's a small matrix, it's probably making more sense, or in the heap, because if you want to store your tensor on the stack, you're probably crazy. You can also use it for, for non-scientific things. So the slab allocator is how Linux does allocations in the kernel. Uh, the point is basically that you allocate and free objects in batches so that you don't always have to do a full construction every time you allocate a mutex, for example. Uh, the thing is, you might want to choose your batch size and how eager you are to reclaim memory depending on how costly it is to construct these things. So you could have a parameter statically that tells you that. You could also use the fact that you could carry on the size of your types in the type system and then use that to decide whether or not to inline the memory, uh, the metadata that the slab allocator requires to handle the thing straight into the data. Because otherwise, for small types, you're basically uh, doing as many allocations for your management as you are doing for your actual data. So. Uh, second rabbit hole was ABI, and ABI is basically API's big brother. Uh, ABI is, stands for Application Binary Interface, and API is about what you can do with a library. ABI is about how, how you call a function, how you represent a type in memory, and the general concept is that you here is the CPU, and that if you infringe anything, you get into undefined behavior. So uh, in RustConf, I talk about, uh, talk about calling conventions. Not going to even bother here. I'm going to go straight to type representation, which is how you lay out your types in memory. 
there are a few kinds of types. Uh, product type or struct is the easiest one. Uh, you have basically two questions. How are your fields ordered and are they aligned? Quick parenthesis on alignment. Alignment is about making sure that the CPU can read your values in one stroke. Some CPUs, if they can't do that because they don't actually load things by per byte or bit per bit, they load it by chunks of memory. And some CPUs, if they can't do that, will throw a helper exception at you. If you tell the compiler that you might be doing this by stating that your representation is packed or something else, it will, tell, it will tell the CPU to do the bit shifting manually, and then the CPU will agree to it. But if you don't, it might throw a hardware exception at you, which is bad, and also it will be slow if it isn't throwing that hardware exception. More interesting than structs is some types, enums. Here, the main question is, is how do you distinguish your variants, and once you know which variant you are, where is your data? Because there's no reason for it to be just at the start of the type if the type is much bigger than your variant's data. Finally, unit types are funny. Since they only have one value, why even store them in memory? So maybe they're zero sized. And actually, maybe even references to them could be zero sized. Because if you don't store them in memory, does a reference make sense? So let's see what C thinks about all of that. So for structures, Fields are always aligned unless you specify a packed representation. And fields are going to be source ordered, which makes it super easy to waste memory. Uh, so here I have a structure where I have a single byte after U32, which means that A, I'm not using the memory right after the first field, and B, I'm actually using more memory after because C likes to divide things by size, which me and rather than alignment, which means that it wants size to be a multiple of alignment. If I just shift the uh, if I just shift the byte further, I get more space. I might get more space usage, and this actually matters a lot to performance. Uh, Zenu has gotten 15% faster on type of layout optimization alone last year, and I mean we're already two orders of magnitude faster than Kafka and MQTT. So, yeah, uh, some types are super easy in C. They're not here. <laughs> <laughs> So instead, what you do is you hand roll them by doing a union, which is an enum, but that doesn't know what it is, and you put a tag on it. And since you're using C and nothing is simple, you're probably going to want to keep it simple and put an, uh, an external tag, which is going to take more memory. Finally, unit types. Uh, well, technically, you could just have a byte that you never read, but you're not allowed to have zero size types because, like I said, C likes to divide by size. And C++ actually does very hilarious things with fieldless structures to try and get back that single byte. <laughs> so let's see the Rust ABI. On product types, uh, we still have order aligned fields, but now ordering is decided by the compiler to try and minimize memory usage. So you're wasting less memory most often. Some types, we have them. And Best thing is the tag may be put in what we call a niche. A niche is, for example, the fact that several of your variants have common padding, so you can just use that padding to place your, your determinant, or by the fact that some types may have forbidden values, and if the bytes at this spot are of that forbidden values, you're not in that type. Finally, we have ZSTs, so zero size types, but the references to them are not zero sized because that's usually how we do opaque pointers. So, zooming in a bit on some types, if I want to do a maybe borrowed string, I will do a carry str. So here's a str. It has a start pointer that is not zero and a length. A string has a start pointer, a length, and a capacity to know when to reallocate. And on a bad day, a carry is going to look like this. It's going to have a first byte that's used only for one bit, then a couple bytes to pad, and then the actual variance. But on a nice day, and ever since 1.65, barring a couple of regressions, we've had a nice layout for cows where the stray is shifted a bit. And that way, we have zero signaling that it's a stray. And if it's not zero, we know we are in the string for the pointer, for the pointer of the string. Uh, Rust makes very few guarantees about ABI. Uh, this is not guaranteed to happen. Uh, and basically, the only guarantee about ABI is that it is not, it will change. <laughs> uh, it can change on many bases. It can change just because you've changed your optimization level. So it's not just a compiler version thing. So why would you want a stable ABI? 
it's all about dynamic linkage. And in Rust, we've made static linkage so easy that we tend to forget about dynamic linkage. There are two flavors. Runtime linkage, you typically use with lib loading, and it lets you do plugins. And the other one is load time linkage. Here, your executable just asks the US very politely, hey, when you, when you load me, could you link me to libc, most likely? Uh, because that way, A, you're more memory efficient, and most importantly, in my opinion, the moment the lib gets patched on the system, you get patched too. Whereas if you're all doing everything with static linkage, if a vulnerability is found, you now have to update your dependency, compile, and ship it to every one of your clients. And you and every other person depending on that library has to do the same thing. So yeah, the only problem with dynamic linkage is that linkers are dumb. They don't know what ABI is. They only, stitch they only do stitching binary together which means that if you have a plugin that thinks the first U size of a vector is a pointer to the start of the vector, and the host thinks that the first U size is actually the length, the moment the host passes that vector to a, plug to a plugin, the plugin is going to try to dereference a length. And if you're lucky, uh, the OS will catch that and throw you a sec fault. If you're not lucky, you're going straight into reading random buffers. So yeah. Uh, Segfault is usually the, great, the, the way that it goes, no. if you're lucky. <laughs> so yeah, let's actually combine the things and prove that we have a stable ABI. And the way we do that is by implementing one. So introducing Stabby, it's a crate. It's on, the, uh, it's on crates at IO. I made it, <laughs> you're welcome. It works with any version of Rust that, uh, is, that has GATS, because it uses the GATS tricks to compute. It, ha it provides you a stable ABI. It has compact sum types, so it does niche optimization in a deterministic way. It supports multi-trait objects. It has a stable allocator API, because, yeah, I'd like to be able to allocate, please. Uh, and it has a spec, so if you're crazy enough and you know Zig or C++ well enough, you can implement Stabby for them, too. <laughs> Uh, so let's prove some stability, and we're back at doing things with traits. So I have a traits table, and in there I'm going to carry information about my type. I'm going to carry its size as an unsigned. I'm going to carry its alignment as a power of two because that lets me do modular arithmetic. I'm going to carry what forbidden values is, are in there. So this is going to be a set of lists of pairs of offsets and values. <laughs> I'm going to have the unused bits as a bit mask, and I'm going to keep track of whether or not the Rust compiler thinks there's only one niche for it, because that way I can tell whether or not option of it is stable. Finally, I'm going to have a report that's just going to let me do a quick bit of reflection when loading a library. So that's about it. And the way you use it is you, you just stabby stabby all the things. Uh, so stabby stabby works basically like repo C. Uh, actually, it implies repo C. Uh, but it will give you a compile error if you are misordering your fields. And it derives i's table at the same time, doing all the type math for you, so that the information about your structure is known to Stabby, and that we can have enums. And the enums are going to be turned into a balanced binary tree of results. So it's gonna look like this, or like that if you prefer the code version. And these results are Stabby results, and they work by being a tagged union, except the tag is computed by the type system, and it might be a zero size type that actually tells you how to look into the union to find the real tag. So here's the algorithm to find the tag. Uh, basically, look into the unused bits of either type to find the forbidden values of the others. If you can't, try and find an intersection in the bits mask, and if that doesn't work, you try and shift the smallest type by its alignment and try again. You try up to eight times, and here piano numbers are making a comeback because this algorithm being a loop, it could recurse forever, and therefore it does. So tips and tricks about making computation with the type system. Uh, piano numbers, they're still useful for two things mostly. Uh, they're useful to uh, stop infinite recursions. That means that you have to always have algorithms that you know are bounded. So yeah, you can't do everything with a type system, sorry. 
Uh, it also helps you uh, by working as indices when you are looking through a list. So for example, the trait objects in Stabby work by looking into a list of vtables uh, that are concatenated at compile time. And it, to do so, it needs to find a type that matches a certain trait, except there could be conflicts. So the way you do that is that you look for a pair of a piano number and the type, and then you just let the, the inference engine infer the index. And that's how you can actually get your traits to work in multi-trait objects. Uh, quick tip, reduce your proofs as soon as you can because they are costly. It is a proof engine, it is basically prologue. And proof engines are great because they can do everything slowly. <laughs> so the main goal is going to be to try and converge to the same set of types as soon as you can so for example, if you are trying to do a proof about types based on their size, try to immediately go to their size representation because that way, if you've already done the proof for types that have the same sizes, you already have the proof, it's cached. So it's free. Uh, there are tricks to emulate specialization, they all imply where close hell. And finally, you need to learn when to give up. This one I cannot teach you, you'll have to find out for yourself but you will have to. You can't do everything, and some things that you can do, you really shouldn't. <laughs> so, in conclusion, Typhoo is a language. It is horrid. Don't do it unless you really need to do something at compile time. It has lots of limits, but it works today, and GATs have made the limits a bit easier. Generate const expressions are the same grail, the holy grail, and they will save us from Typhoo because the moment they become stable is the moment we can replace everything with them. Uh, you can do lots of things with TypeNum. I think I showed a few examples. They all come at a cost to your sanity first and to your compile time second. And yeah, you have now cursed. Have fun with all of that. I hope you had fun and time for questions. <laughs> I was actually much faster than expected. Usually it takes 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you got any questions, I, I have the mic. Just raise your hand. <laughs> um, does Stappy support pack types? Uh, pack types, uh, not yet. I should do that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, you're not also cursed. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. There, there's a whole list of things. I, I've started going into allocators and making sure that you can switch from a vector to a box to an arc without needing to reallocate. So I'm already going all the way. <laughs> so you mentioned you use this in Zeno for your plugin system. Is this primarily used for Rust-to-Rust -Rust plugging interface, or do you use also for cross-language uh, Yeah, so two things. Uh, for Zeno, the plan is to use it. Hasn't been implemented yet because we have a feature list, a wish list, the size of the room. So for now, it is on hold. I'm hoping to have a new implementation of Zeno based on Stabby at some point. But that's Zeno today, you have a plugin interface but with some kind of... Today we have a plugin interface and for now it works mainly by checking that you had the same compiler version and options and praying that things will work out. <laughs> Robust. This is the general plugin approach uh, when you do pure Rust to Rust. But the thing is, uh, if we wanted to have something that was more ABI stable or even IPC, we'd be losing the only reason we are doing plugins, which is to share the same session between the nodes. Uh, that are uh, used by plugins in Zenu. And second thing is, yes, yeah, Stabby is mainly aimed at Rust to Rust. Uh, the goal was to kind of have everything nice about Rust, the traits, the futures, closures, all of that, and be able to use them um, from uh, over the FFI boundary without having to pray that it works. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it has a spec so that at some point it could be implemented in other languages but for now, there's no other implementation. It's just Rust. <laughs> Hi. Um, so if I understood your ABI stuff, the, the calling program, um, by virtue of all the 
nice math that you wrote in the type system, knows how to interpret the structures of the uh, the linked library. Yeah, but so that but that information is not actually encoded in the linked library. It's in the source code. So, oh, this is going to be slow. <laughs> There we are. Uh, so basically, to get an agreement, both the link, the linked, and the um, both sides have to agree on the type representation. The thing that Stabby does is that it makes it deterministic, and the other thing that it does is that it includes a tiny report like that. Uh, when you export a function using the Stabby macros, it will actually export a second symbol with these reports so that the, the host can check whether the report on the layout is the same as expected. Could it interpret, like if you did have cross-language things, could that report be interpreted by the caller to understand? Could, the representation of the report is a BI's table, so it, yes. could be, it could also be read and interpreted. I, I'm just imagining someone in a thousand years linking some old library and wondering how the structures are thing that would work. Yeah, it yeah. could. So my question uh, would be about the uh, RFC. I think there's some uh, th something opened uh, by Josh Triplett, I think. Uh, he calls that something um, around uh, ABI, a stable ABI for, for us, which is higher level than uh, what C provides. Uh, do you think uh, your use cases would be met by that, or do they go further? They are somewhat similar. Uh, to me, the goal was really to get compact sum types because like I said, uh, we get huge performance benefits by doing that. And for now, this is out of scope for the Krabby RFC. But uh, yeah, the goal with the Krabby RFC is, uh, is to get an ABI that is stable, that ha has a bit more coverage of the Rust concepts, but is usable from other languages. Uh, with Stabby, that was the kind of the least of my concern. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the question is about uh, uh, compile time uh, overhead, and essentially, it's obviously that will be some. But did you try to measure and uh, to measure if it scales? Something like if you have a complex workspace and you have uh, a plugin uh, in one of the crates and you use them in twenty other crates, uh, does the build time complexity scale with the number of crates or not? Over there, it's just a random, an open-ended question because I didn't yeah. have the time to think it through. Yeah, but so like I said, uh, so there was a tip about trying to converge as soon as you can to getting the same representation for every type. Uh, the reason for that tip is that originally Stabby didn't, and any declaration of an enum would cost you one second of compile time, <laughs> which is a lot. Uh, now it is much faster, and I still haven't gotten Stabby or any project that uses it to a scale where the compile times become unacceptable. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I, have, I don't have a proper measure of how they impact, because right now, if you define two enums that use the same uh, variants, the second one's going to be free. So it really depends on how similar your enums are going to be, basically. But if you have a single plugin in the whole workspace, is the cost amortized, or does every crate in the workspace pay for the, all the type inference that, that needs to be done? I, so I would say, uh, so typically, if you want to do a plugin, what you do is you'd have one crate that defines the types that you use uh, for your boundary, and then you have everything depending on it. If they're all within the same workspace or somewhere where they can be, they can cache the computation, step the computation about uh, the representation could be done in that crate, so it should be done only once. Perfect, that was exactly the question, thanks. Thank you. So you mentioned at a certain point that the Oli Grail is const genetic expression. Yeah. How would that change the landscape here? Uh, what does that include, I guess? Because it's a lot of like const genetic feature flags and they support uh, so different parts of things. The, the main thing it would change is kind of the back end that does the computation. Instead of having a proof engine, you'd have the proper function that you're defining that works on much smaller scales of types. And so uh, it's not so much that it would change. Um, so it would change how you do things, which is helpful because I think you've gathered that this is not exactly ergonomic. <laughs> 
So I'd much rather be able to do all of that with defining const functions. And on the other hand, these const functions are going to be evaluated. There's still going to be a weight on proof about uh, typically exhaustivity. So it's not going to be as cheap as just evaluating the thing, but it is going to be cheaper than just doing everything through proofs. If you could ask for advances in what the type system, the type slash trait system can do in terms of computation, what would be? Give us specialization, please. I beg of you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. So thank you, Pierre. Well, thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank you.